man. <laughs> if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, First Peter or, uh, chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2 is, uh, you're getting there. Of course, if you didn't realize, we'd been having a lot of computer issues. and So I've had to, uh, first I had to update the computer, now it's on Windows 11. And then I went from there, and that didn't fix it. So then I checked all the the different cores, make sure everything was in right, and that didn't fix it. So then I had to update the OBS, and that didn't fix it. So then I had to get rid of the of the camera off of it, and then put it back on there. And then that hopefully fixed it. We'll be able to tell after tonight. But as we look there in 1 Peter chapter 2, we're going to try to look at uh, about three verses here uh, as we find that the Bible says in verse 18, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable if because of uh, conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly. For what credit is it if, when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you tonight, I just simply ask that you would uh, to be with us. Father, I thank you for what you have done. Lord, I thank you for what you are doing. Father, I just simply ask that you would be high and lifted up in our lives. And as you were high and lifted up in our lives, if there are things that may need to be changed... Father, help us to see that, and Father, make it so. For your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. Now, as you look here in uh, verse 18, uh, when you see the word servants, uh, you typically the word servant you'll find throughout your Bible, and it, you'll f actually find it in Peter, uh, I believe it's in verse uh, 13 maybe, or 14 is uh, the word doulos, and that is a simply a slave or an ambassador, somebody that uh, has been bought with a price and has no chance of ever being let go. And that's really what we are as children of God. We are to be slaves unto the Lord. We are to be servants. But when we look at this word, it is a different word. Uh, I'll, I'll spell it for you. Uh, and then you can try to figure out how to pronounce it. O-I-K-E-T-E-S. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, but anyway. Uh, this word is not a just a slave, but it is a residential servant. It is one that lives in the house of their Lord. Now, we can look at that from the spiritual aspect. We can look at it from the historical and the physical aspect of it. In the spiritual aspect, if you are a child of God, then that means you are living in the house of the Lord. Now, if we look at that from a physical aspect, that just simply meant what this would be the house servants. Uh, and with that, we, we know what we got. It's a residential servant that lives in the house, and as they live in the house, they are a doer of the menial domestic task of a servant. Now, as we look at that, we, we need to understand that if we are, as uh, Peter is saying here, if we are this type of servant, we are living in the house of the Lord, uh, then that means that we must do the menial domestic task of a servant. That means there are going to be some things that maybe we don't want to do, but guess what? we got to do them. Guarantee you, uh, Brother Keith here, uh, uh, after you guys have gotten up all your stuff, uh, all of your crops, there are going to be some menial tasks you got to do to get ready for the next season. 
Some of them might not even be fun, but you still do them. Same thing would go for uh, Miss Sheila with your classes. After you've taught your last classes and uh, you've uh, graded your last exams, you still got to average out the grades. You still got to look at well, what worked well, what wor didn't work well. You've got to look at these different things that go on. And these may be menial tasks that we do, but those menial tasks have an outcome that we need. Same thing with the menial tasks that we do for Christ. It may be the little things. It may be the nitpick things that we have to do, but those still do have to be done. Now, as you look at that, we find that these are uh, living in the same house with the master, and so they are treated, here you go, these servants are to be treated like family. So how we treat people matters. If we are all servants of God, living under His roof, living in His presence, therefore we must all be as family. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, I'm going to ask a simple question before we go any further, and that question is simply this. How do we treat one another? That's an amen or that's an oh me. That's something that we have to look at. And as we look at that, we must then understand that what we do and why we do it does matter. Last week, we talked about how perceptions matter. This week, we can simply look at as the role of a servant of Christ, what we do matters. Like I said, it is a different uh, than uh, the do loss. Uh, do loss, as we'll find, bond servant. That was in, I believe, uh, verse 1 of Peter. Uh, same, it would be in James 1, it's in uh, Romans 1, uh, where he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims, to the elect, according, so forth. But we find here that he is a servant. To be a servant means we've got to be under subjection. And some people don't like that word. How many of us want to be subject to somebody else and what they have to say? But yet we find that in this, to be under subjection means that we are devoted to someone else. How's your devotion to Christ? We all know people that say that they are a child of God. But when you look at their devotion to Christ, they have none. We all know those people. We all know those that say they are, but yet they don't. Jesus calls those hypocrites. Dr. Stanley called them cultural Christians. Cottle Adelman calls them fans. All are right. If we are going to be a servant, by the way, you are a servant no matter where you are. You're a slave of something. You're either a slave to sin and self and Satan, or you're a slave of Jesus Christ. And here we find, as he goes on, this, this role as a servant, this uh, is, number one, to be submissive. Uh, look there again in verse 18, servants. Be submissive to your masters with all fear. So this word is uh, hupotza, hupotza, I believe it is. Uh, but as we look at it, it means it's somebody, if we are a servant that is submissive, that means we're going to obey the master. We're going to obey what these 66 love letters say. Now we did uh, this past Sunday in Sunday school, I, I taught, on how to study your Bible. And there is a verse, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, and again, maybe in Leviticus, it talks about how men aren't supposed to show their legs. Well, I don't think uh, that, that Moses understood what it's like here, right? Amen. 
<laughs> but at <laughs> in southwest Georgia, that's right. Oh, but at the same time, some some of those we could say, well, that was under the law, and now we're under grace, or vice versa. And uh, really what the law was was a schoolmaster. We all should know that. We've read Galatians. We've taught through Galatians. We know that what the law did is it showed us where we were wrong. And it pointed to the fact that we needed redemption. That redemption is through Jesus Christ. And because of that, we are to obey our master. How are you doing at that, by the way? I, mean, I didn't say, are you obeying your spouse? I said, are you obeying your master? When he tells you to do something, do you do it or do you lollygag? You guys use that word down here, right? Lollygag. Well, I know I need to, but I, I don't want to, so I'm, not, I'm going to wait to the last second, then I want to try to put it together. Like somebody owes thousands of dollars in taxes, and they wait till April 15th to get the, uh, the extension, right? They know they need to, but yet they don't want to. That's the same way we act sometimes. When we know that God has called us as, uh, as his children, as his servants to do something, and we don't do it. But this word submissive means that we yield to the master. Now this is, this is a kicker, voluntarily. And all God's people said, ouch. Right? Voluntarily means he doesn't have to make you do it. We all had kids in this room, right? What was the one thing you for most kids, especially when they were teenagers, that they absolutely hated and kicked and screamed not to do. Clean their rooms. Except for Kelly. <laughs> but they didn't do it voluntarily, right? How many times is that the same way we act with God? How many times do we as servants of God, don't do what he says voluntarily. When we look at that, we, we need to understand that he goes a little bit deeper. He says, to be submissive to your masters with all fear. That word fear there means reverence. Now we can, we need to really, we need to look at this in a different aspect and, and I'll get to uh, Ephesians 6 here in a minute. But it, it, we need to understand that everything we do for our boss, we are to do as unto the Lord. We are to be reverent to them because we are reverent to our master. And then he goes on and he says there, not only to the good and gentle. What does that mean? That just means some masters are better than others. But also to the harsh. Okay? So as you look there, we need to understand that what we must do, as he says in verse 13, is we are to submit, which means that we render what is due. We do the work as a Christian... But here we find also that we are not to be respecters of persons, whether they're gentle or they're harsh. Has anybody ever worked to a boss you absolutely hated? Am I the only one that's ever had a boss you really didn't like? How about those bosses you really did like? Which ones you do more for? Ones you liked, right? But what does Peter say? Treat them the same. See, Peter is challenging the Christian, which were slaves in a lot of cases, to submit and to respect even the harsh. The word there for harsh is where we get the word scoliosis. It means to be crooked or to be warped. So, are there bosses out there that are crooked? Yeah. 
Are there bosses out there that are unfair? Are there bosses out there that are warped in their mind, in their mindset? Are there bosses that might be perverse? And yet we have to treat them the same way that we treat the gentle, the good. If you look, and I'm, I'm just going to go over there real fast. If you want to uh, write it down or we, you can read it with me. Ephesians 6. I'm going to look at verses 5 uh, through 9. But, but we need to understand as not being a respecter of persons, that means that our fiduciary duty towards our employers matter. We'll look there. We'll find verses uh, 5 through 9. Bond servants, same word, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in sincerity of heart as to Christ. So, how are we to treat them? As if they're the Lord over us. Not with eye service, as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ. So, we go about our duty as servants of Christ, doing things as everything is being done for Christ. Doing the will of God from the heart. That doesn't mean that we just follow the letter of the law. We're not to be Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes. But we do it from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So, real quick question. Why do you do what you do? Doing for the Lord. Not because we get a check. Knowing whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord. Whether he is a slave or he's free. And you masters, okay, here you go. For you masters or you bosses, do the same things to them. Giving up, threatening, knowing that your own, uh, that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. So, what does that mean for the boss? You treat them as you want to be treated. You're to do for them as you would want done. I think there was a golden rule about that. You may have read a golden rule about that. Those words are in red, right? So, the question is, is this true in your personal life? Is this how you conduct your life as a servant of the Lord? Whether or not you're a master, whether or not you are a, a, a worker, a laborer, in either case, we must look, is this true in our own lives? Is what we are doing for the glory of God or for the glory of self? Go on to verse 19 with me if you would. For this is the, uh, okay, so this is going with the first part, but also to the harsh. So to the, the crooked uh, boss, you still got to be submissive. You got to uh, submit. For this is commendable. If you have a 1769 version of the Bible, uh, it's going to be the word think worthy. In either case, in the Greek, it is a very word that we know. It's the word charis. I can say that word because I've said it enough times. Charis is the word grace. See, as it is commendable, even when we go through the harshness of a bad boss, we can only do that through grace. can only do that through grace. As that then keeps our attention on the provision of God. When you've had a hard time at work and you go home and you're ready just to cry and give up. Anybody ever been there? We still get through it through His grace. Through his provision. Jesus said in Matthew 5. 
verse 10. Matthew 5, 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when we are persecuted, we have a reward in heaven. Now, it doesn't mean you go out looking for it, right? <laughs> you don't look for those persecutions. <laughs> but when we are persecuted, there is a reward in heaven. With that, we find that we are to also endure grief. Look there again, uh, verse 19. Uh, this is commendable for the cause of conscience toward God. One endures grief. That means that we endure sadness. We endure the sorrows of life. We suffer even though we shouldn't. You ever been there? You ever had to go through something though you didn't deserve it? Guess how you got through it? Through grace. That's what this verse says. It helps in our conscience toward God. Now, when you look at that word toward God, the word toward there means it's directional. Alright? So, this that we're going through, it is directional because we're giving it to the Lord. We're getting through it through the Lord. It also helps us in our relationship. This word toward means a relational aspect. Remember what Jesus said when he said, uh, don't be uh, amazed when they hate you because they hated me first. You're going to be judged because you're a Christian. Now I know we live in the Western culture and it's not as good as it was probably 70 years ago. Amen? But we're not nearly as persecuted as the rest of the world. But we find here that when we go through these, it helps in our relationship and it progresses our sanctification. We become more like Christ. You see, this is because it changes us spiritually. We don't have to be that big, fat baby that sits on the pew every week for 50 years. But we grow in Christ as he changes us to make us what he wants us to be we are changed morally those things that we used to want to do eventually if we are striving to be closer to Christ we're going to say I don't need that any longer I guarantee you there's some of that in your own life or maybe your, your children's lives or maybe it was in your, your, your parents lives where they, they, that we wanted something so bad, and then God eventually said, Son, daughter, you don't need that. And our morals were changed. It changes us completely. We're not the people we used to be. If I were to ask you this question, I'm going to ask you to think about it. And if somebody wants to answer that question, it's great. How has God changed you? He also changes our understanding. See, there's some things that you go through, or I go through, that we all go through, and we don't understand why. 5, 10, 15 years down the road, we figure it out, don't we? I was talking with a, a, a pastor friend. He's, he's having to help a, another pastor that he knows get through some hard things at his church. And um, just quite simply, uh, as all three of us are, are sitting there, we're all talking. And he says, you know, I can help in this because I've been through this.
you know, the uh, experience is the thing that you get after you needed it. Amen? But how many times has God helped you in your understanding? Then what do you do with that? Do you pay it forward? Or you just forget it and do it again? I was reading in a book one time about uh, marriage. Some people are married one year 50 times. Now, some people are married 50 years one time. Do you get what, what that's talking about? Some people don't learn. And they go through the same problems week after week, month after month, year after year, never truly getting it. And therefore, they have rocky marriages. While others learn what works for one and the other, and then they do work together as a team. Peter sets forth a principle here that can uh, be applied in any situation. Whether you're going through unjust suffering or not. How you endure matters. How you endure matters. But the question is, have you actually endured? Because you look there in verse 20, that as we endure, as verse uh, uh, 19 said, as we endure, we, we find there it says, for what credit is it that word credit there is the word glory for what glory is it you endure great but is it for the glory of God or is it for the glory of self if it's for the glory of self then you're still in sin if it's for the glory of God you have a reward in heaven here we find when you're beaten for your own faults Maybe you, maybe you needed it. Such as we, we heard that Miss Margaret's going to get out the paddle and going to give me a whipping or something, right? Make sure it's an easy one, please. <laughs> but when you're punished for your own sins, there's no credit. Other than how you endured. But when you're punished for doing good, enduring it patiently... You are completing the glorifying God. Now, in context, let's take this back to context. He's talking to servants. He's talking to slaves. And these servants or slaves would be beaten because they would not partake in the pagan worship of their master. That is context, what he's talking about. Peter's saying... Yeah, you can't worship that pagan God. But God's still getting the glory because you're enduring it for Him. How often is it easy for us to fly off the handle and serve self instead of serving God? Sometimes we've got to fall on the sword. When we are punished for our faith, because of our refusal to join in pagan worship, that's a good thing. Now, you may say, and I had this conversation earlier with uh, someone, uh, you may have this question, well, uh, how can I worship you and other gods if there's only one God? Well, the answer to that we find in Exodus chapter 20. Anything we put in front of God becomes our God. So, if somebody is going to persecute you because you do not partake in their worship of another God instead of the God of heaven, that's for, your glory. That's for God's glory. Let it happen. Because great is reward in heaven. You see, it is respectful to submit to the underserved that are suffering. 
that there finds that with God because such behavior demonstrates His grace. When we can suffer and endure for Christ, it shows the grace in our lives. If you'll remember, and I'll, I'm, I'm about done, if you'll remember, uh, Peter cries out to God to, to do something for him, and God says no, and he says, My grace is sufficient. What are you going through right now? Because we're all either going through something, coming out of something, or about to go through something. What are you going through right now? That maybe you need the grace of God to take care of it all. All right. With that, let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Fathers, uh, we come before you right now. Help us to see that we are to be a servant. Father, as we go throughout this week, if there is something that, that comes up that we don't even know, we don't even know how to handle it. Father, help us to endure your glory. Lord, right now, if there is something that maybe we are having to endure for your glory, Father, I just ask for your grace, for your charis, that you will pull us through and be able to see your glory on the other side. In your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen.